Welcome to the latest Novagene webinar, a microbiome analysis from sample to data analysis. Today's webinar is a little different and features a guest presentation from Clinical Microbiomics. This is the sixth in our lockdown webinar series. We'll send you details of the rest of the program after the webinar. A little bit of housekeeping. The webinar will last one hour with around 10 minutes for a question and answer session at the end. Please submit your questions for both clinical microbiomics and for Novagene via the question and answer chat functionality you will see at the bottom of your screen. We'll answer as many questions as we can. But if we can't answer your questions live, we'll be in touch by email after the webinar. I'd like to introduce you to your host for today, Jalal Chahabi. Born and raised in Denmark, Jalal holds a BSc in Health Informatics from the University of Copenhagen and an MSc in Bioinformatics and Systems Biology from the Technical University of Denmark. His research at the Centre for Basic and Metabolic Research in Copenhagen was in metabol metabolic epigenetics. There he focused on bioinformatics, including epigenomics and transcriptomics. Jalal, over to you. Thanks for the word, John. My name is uh, Jalal Shahabi, and I'm the regional account manager of Novogen in Denmark. Um, first of all, I would like to spend a couple of minutes introducing Novogen as a company. Uh, Novogen, um, Novogen's mission um, is to provide cutting edge uh, genomic technologies to improve life science research and human healthcare. The company was founded in March 2011 in our Beijing headquarters. Novogene has one of the largest sequencing centers in the world, and based on our lab data, we are able to process more than 120,000 shotgun metagenomic samples on a yearly basis. At Novogene, we provide our valued clients high sequencing quality. Uh, we support our clients with bioinformatics analysis. We use a modern uh, state-of-the-art technology, including Illumina, PacBio, and Nanopore. Moreover, we have one of the largest sequencing capacities worldwide. And finally, we provide our clients with the fastest turnaround time. Here is a map of where Novogene is located today. As previously mentioned, we started back in, in 2011 in our Beijing headquarters. And uh, since the establishment of the company, we have been growing rapidly, uh, resulting in multiple subsidiaries uh, around the globe. Just to mention a few, we have a subsidiary in the United States. Uh, we also have our um, uh, lab in, the, in Cambridge, in, in UK, where we have the majority of our European market. Uh, and more recently, we are in the pipeline of establishing our subsidiary in the Netherlands. Just to give you a brief idea uh, about uh, what we can offer in terms of genomic uh, services, um, we have a, a broad experience uh, within animal and plant genome. We have been involved in, in a lot of uh, prestigious de novo genome sequencing projects. We also do whole genome resequencing, uh, both in terms of bacteria and fungi. We also do um, sequencing within the, the, with the human genome, both uh, clinical uh, but also non-clinical. Uh, we do whole genome sequencing, whole exome sequencing, uh, but also target capture sequencing. We also do a lot of microbial uh, sequencing uh, in terms of uh, shotgun metagenomics and amplicon profiling, which we will be talking much more about later on in this uh, webinar. We also do, um, we also offer services within the uh, gene regulation field, um, both uh, epigenetics, but also transcriptomics. Uh, within the epigenetics field, we are uh, capable of um, providing whole genome bisulfate sequencing, chip sequencing, RIP sequencing. Uh, in the transcriptomic field, we provide, uh, of course, RNA sequencing uh, with many different types of library buildings, including poly-A selection, stranded, non-stranded, uh, but also ribosomal RNA depletion. So we can help our clients um, with whatever, whatever they need. We also do non-coding RNA sequencing, single cell RNA sequencing, and ISO6 sequencing. However, this um, webinar will be focusing on microbial sequencing. Um, 
And today we are very happy to have our um, very uh, great collaborator, Clinical Microbiomics, with us today. We started our collaboration back in 2017. Uh, and today we have uh, processed more than 10,000 samples uh, for clinical microbiomics. Um, I would like to just mention a few of clinical microbiomics as, um, as strength as a company. Uh, they provide high quality extraction services. They have a very, very strong um, clinical expertise. Um, and this is based on their diverse backgrounds uh, in terms of academia and, and educational backgrounds. Um, and finally, they are very strong in bioinformatics analysis and they can always uh, customize um, their ana analysis um, uh, according to their clients' needs. Novogene um, has an international team um, compromising of uh, 25 local representatives um, based in different places in, in Europe. Uh, we are able to speak more than 15 languages um, and we can help um, you to achieve your research goals. If you would like to get in, in touch with the Novogene, you can contact us by mail and your request will go to the corresponding regional account managers in the different regions. Thank you very much for listening. And now I would like to introduce uh, Jakob from Clinical Microbiomics. Jakob Backholm has a PhD and he is a Director of Scientific Operations at Clinical Microbiomics. Jakob has, uh, has a broad experience in human and element animal microbiome research. Um, and he is an expert in data analysis, laboratory techniques. Um, and at Clinical Microbiomics, Jakob has a leading role in driving innovation in the company and oversees the client's uh, projects from data generation to final analysis. And I will pass the word to Jakob from Clinical Microbiomics. Thank you, Jacella. Uh, nice introduction and uh, nice to get some uh, some info on, on Novogen uh, already. Uh, Novogen is um, is a, a very a good collaborator of ours, uh, and one of the main reasons for that is uh, the quality of the data that we receive, because some of the data you some of the analysis you will see in this presentation is um, is essential to have high quality sequencing data to to be able to actually perform. Likewise, uh, as uh, Jalal mentioned, uh, the capacity is, uh, is a, a really an advantage from Novogene's side with uh, having the ability to process studies of, of many thousand samples uh, with low um, batch uh, variation. So, so indeed, uh, the data generated uh, is essential for the, what's possible to, to perform uh, in terms of analysis. So today, um, um, this webinar is going to focus on, on the whole pipeline, not just the sequencing. It's going to focus on, on uh, how to perform a microbiome a study from very early on, from the sample, uh, gen uh, collecting the samples onto extraction sequencing and uh, data analysis. So we'll cover the, the full topic today. And uh, briefly, um, I think on the next slide here, Oh, sorry, I uh, just want to mention also that uh, we have already planned the next microbiome webinar. That will be on Thursday, the 24th of September. Uh, again, focusing on the microbiome, uh, we will have a more specific topic uh, coming up uh, soon. So Clinical Microbiomics, we are a contract research uh, organization and we are fully dedicated to microbiome research. We do the full pipeline from study analysis uh, through uh, data generation, analysis and interpretation. We work a lot with uh, clinical and preclinical studies and also a lot of animal health studies. We have a bioinformatic team. Uh, they are located here in our headquarter in Copenhagen in Denmark. And they all have uh, experience uh, within the bioinformatics fields of uh, microbiomics. So they're able to, to make the customized analysis and also able to perform more uh, advanced uh, analysis, uh, like for example, with machine learning or you know, discovery of, of microbes and similar. And we're constantly building on all of these tools and expanding the, the, the portfolio of, of different analysis that we can provide our clients. Uh, we also do a lot to um, help uh, identifying biomarkers and, and new uh, therapeutic targets. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about this today also. So clinical microbiomics are, um, 
have a global client base, uh, sequenced more than 18,000 shotgun uh, metagenomic samples, and we are specialized in, in uh, working with the deep uh, sequenced metagenomics data. Uh, our microbiome studies are always customized to the specific, uh, specific need of the, the study, so that uh, no, study are the, no study are the same, they are always made to fit the scope of the project. Uh, our aim is to deliver something that you are easy to uh, interpret and that you are easy to uh, also publish uh, or use for your, 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 your the, how, however you want to use it. If it's for internal development or new drug or if it's for uh, academic publications. So um, the full workflow that we will go through today and which also represents the workflow of a microbiome project at a Clinical Microbiomics is that you, we start out with meeting our, you as the client and, and assist and uh, also try to understand the, the scope and the study design uh, that you are, you're going for in your microbiome study. And here we can advise you on how to collect the samples and also we will uh, align with uh, the way you're collecting the samples and your sample types in terms of how we will do the DNA extraction. Likewise, we discuss what is the aim of the data analysis and analysis scope to make sure that the correct samples and the correct sample amounts are collected to really answer the, the questions of interest. Then we'll move on to uh, how to collect the sample and how to store the samples. Uh, we'll go on to DNA extractions uh, through sequencing, both uh, amplicon sequencing and shotgun metagenomics. Uh, and then we will finish off with data analysis uh, and final uh, reporting of the, the results, uh, where through this reporting and discussion of the findings, this might uh, generate new ideas, new hypotheses, uh, and one can jump into some more advanced analysis. And we will also, in this webinar, have just a few examples of some of the more advanced uh, microbiome analysis that you can do. Uh, but they will also be covered more in depth in, in future webinars. But there will be a few of these uh, towards the end of the webinar. So. Now we have a new microbiome study and we are about to do the, the planning of, uh, of the study. So of course, the first thing one uh, aims at is to find out what, what, is, what is the study design and what is the, the aim with, with the study? What are our goals and, and what are our, are our interests? Um, there are many studies that are uh, distinguished by either being very explorative, so you don't have uh, this, a specific, necessarily a specific uh, hypothesis beforehand, but there's likewise also studies where you have a targeted interest. Is this microbe affected by my treatment or is it not? And that of course determines how you set up the study and also how you plan the, the data analysis. Do you have the statistical power to do your analysis? And also, do you have the correct uh, matching control group to do your analysis? And then there's on top of that, of course, a lot of prior knowledge that goes into what is a good design for this study and what is a, a doable uh, hypothesis to test. All of this is something we are very happy to assist in discussing. Then there's the, the sample types. Um, gut, skin, oral, vaginal, respiratory, urine, and different types of animal samples all uh, sample types that we are used to handle in clinical microbiomics. And these are sample types that also need uh, specific uh, care depending on, on which type we are looking at. Because of course, a gut uh, stool sample uh, compared to a swap from a, a skin sample uh, needs a different handling in the, in the laboratory. Then there are some other factors to keep in mind when you plan your study. Uh, one is uh, whether or not your patients are, uh, for example, on antibiotics. antibiotics. Antibiotics will have a large effect on your microbiome in the, in the gut especially. So a screening for um, pat uh, patients to include in the study that are not on antibiotics is, uh, is highly relevant. Likewise, uh, things like season can affect your study. So uh, a and, and less optimal uh, case would be that your control group, for example, is collecting during the winter season and uh, the treatment group is collected during the summer season. There will, you will see some, some bias towards the, due to the seasonal differences. 
health status. Uh, there's a lot about the health that you should collect in, for example, a questionnaire, uh, know about lifestyle, know about uh, weight, uh, know, about, know about ethnicity and, and similar. A lot of things there that are good to con connect, uh, collect beforehand because then at least you can adjust it in your data analysis. Sequencing platform uh, determines what you can, uh, what type of analysis you can do. Uh, we will go more into depth with this, but there are things to consider, such as uh, which method, of course, which target. Do you have a target gene that you want to analyze, or are you going broad and sequencing everything? What is the read length you need to describe your, your data in the best way? And likewise, what is the quality you need to be able to analyze it and the depth of the data sequence, uh, the DNA sequencing? Finally, the data analysis, are you interested in uh, taxonomical differences or would you also like to have the gene functions, for example, uh, and do you need to in integrate it with clinical data or do you have a more complex uh, analysis uh, plan where you're also thinking of having multi-omics, for example, metabolomics data. All of this planning is something that we are very happy to, to assist with uh, and it's very essential for the outcome of your study, of course. So now when we have planned to study, the next thing we will uh, do is that we will, of course, collect some samples. So um, collecting a microbial sample is now uh, collecting a living sample. So whether this is a gut sample or if it's a skin sample, what you're collecting is microbes that are alive. Um, so if you leave a living sample uh, for some time, which is illustrated here from time point zero to time point two, then over time, there will be changes in your uh, sample. And if you imagine a stool sample, when you, take, when you have a stool sample and you just leave it out at room temperature, there will be an increased amount of oxygen exposure. So for example, anaerobic bacteria, they will over time disappear. Likewise, the, ones that can, the microbes that can tolerate uh, oxygen, they will over time potentially increase. So if you wait uh, with preserving your sample, you will have a bias in the composition when you are analyzing it. So therefore, um, it's very important to preserve the sample as quickly as possible. So what we're looking at represents the biological relevant uh, composition. Likewise, it's important to standardize this procedure because if some samples are collected optimal and other are collected less optimal, you will have a large variance in your data set. So at least standardize it and do it as quickly as possible. The ways of preserving your sample, um, they are the more traditional standard approach where you freeze the sample, uh, you snap freeze it ideally. So you freeze it quickly in either li liquid nitrogen, uh, dry ice or directly in minus 80 freezes. And then you store them as cold as possible. This is usually minus 80 degrees freezes. And this has the benefit of uh, that there is limited interference with the sample. And it's also a rather simple uh, approach. You just take the sample, you don't do anything to it, you just freeze it. But the downside is that it's uh, sometimes logistically challenging because having uh, dry ice, liquid nitrogen, even minus 80 freezes is not something that you can really bring to, for example, a, a patient's own uh, home to do home collection. Therefore, there are some challenges here which uh, the newer stabilizing buffers are helping with uh, because there are some new stabilizing buffers on the market, multiple to choose between uh, now. And their benefit is that you can collect a microbiome sample and you can make it stable at room temperature. So that suddenly opens up for some advantages because now you can do easy home collection uh, of the samples, which is really important in terms of compliance. Um, and you also have an inactivated sample so that you can now ship it in, in, in the mail. But of course, whenever you do some uh, change, you introduce uh, something to a, a sample, you will have minor uh, differences uh, that is hard to prevent. So using stabilizing buffers could introduce a minor technical bias. But on the other hand, you have a case where it's much easier to collect the samples, for example, in a, a human trial. So now we have collected the samples and we are moving on to that we would like to do a sequencing based analysis. So the first thing you do is that you uh, take your samples and you try to lyse the bacteria and you do the DNA purification so you have DNA ready for sequencing. 
And what to, to be aware of here is that your microbiome samples are going to be of different uh, sample matrix in a different uh, kinds of matrix, depending on whether it's a gut sample or if it's a skin swab, similar. Uh, and this, these also have different consistency and chemical composition, and also the, the amount of sample material you have will vary. So therefore, the extraction process needs to be optimized to suit the, the samples that you're looking at. Um, doing the lysis step is, is common to use either mechanical lysis or enzymatic lysis. Mechanical lysis is, is great because of the homogenization um, that it performs when you do the bead beating. Uh, this allows to reach all the bacteria that are hidden inside the sample, and it also helps to, to, um, to extract the, the, the DNA from the cells. And here is a, you have a challenge to find the optimal uh, lysis conditions, because now you want to have ideally equal lysis of a lot of different organisms, some that are easy to lyse, some that are difficult to lyse. So spending some time on optimizing this extraction uh, process during the lysis step is, uh, is very important for, for the outcome. Then when you have lysed the cells, you purify the DNA and you are ready to go for the sequencing. When you're uh, preparing your samples for sequencing, uh, one thing that's important to have is high quality DNA. And one uh, example you have here is uh, samples that were nine samples that were extracted and uh, then ran on a gel, uh, gel electrophoresis. And what you can see is that the DNA is in, a, in the uh, top part of the lanes, meaning that it's high integrity DNA. In a, another uh, case here, uh, some other samples that were extracted elsewhere, they are, there's a high amount of degraded DNA, small fragments of DNA. And this gives you some troubles downstream because first of all, it gets tough to understand the amount of DNA you're working on, the amount of DNA strains uh, you have in your sample, and therefore high quality DNA is uh, essential for good, especially shotgun metagenomic sequencing. And just as a rule of thumb, you can, uh, from around 100 milligrams of stool, you usually have around one microgram of DNA. 250 microliters of saliva, you get around one microgram of DNA. And from one skin swab, you're around 100 nanograms of DNA. So for shotgun metagenomics, it's great if you can have around one microgram of DNA. Um, but as you can see now, skin swabs are with significantly less. Um, so there, the low biomass samples, you really want to try and get as much as possible out of your sample. 100 nanograms of DNA is durable to work on, work with, but if you get a lot less than 100 nanograms, it's starting to be tricky. So now we have the bacterial DNA and the microbial DNA, which also includes fungal DNA. Uh, one thing you can do to analyze the composition of your samples is to perform what's referred to as amplicon sequencing. In this, uh, with this technique, you use PCR, to target a specific region of the microbial DNA. This is usually 16S for bacteria and 18S and ITS, ITS for uh, eukaryotes. Um, and you use this uh, target uh, region to, first of all, you amplify it and then you sequence the region. And then based on the, the, the sequence of this uh, region, you can uh, map to watch a database and identify which uh, bacteria or, or fungi it came from. This is a way to get to uh, taxonomical composition analysis, um, but you will not have any info on the genes that are present, for example. This is, this is only taxonomical analysis. It's, it's cost efficient and it's great for uh, an analyzing low biomass samples and high host samples because it's a PCI amplified uh, approach. So you can work with really low biomass samples. If you want to have the more advanced analysis and you want to understand all the different microbes that are in your samples, then shotgun metagenomics is your choice. Because here you sequence all of the DNA present in your sample. That means you get all the bacteria, you get all the fungi, you get all the phages and viruses that are in your sample. So you suddenly have a, a good opportunity to look into the full uh, composition, full diversity of your samples. Now you also have a better resolution with amplicon sequencing due to the, sh the shorter region you are analyzing, you only have around genus to sometimes species level resolution. 
But with shotgun mesogenomics, you can now go down to subspecies and strain resolution. What you can also do is that you can do de novo discovery of uh, the microbes in your sample, because now you have enough information to identify new microbes uh, based on your data. You also have gene abundance, so you can look into which uh, metabolic pathways are present or antibiotic, uh, antibiotic resistant genes. And you can look into phages and viruses and also do this in a de novo discovery based manner. So this is ideal for in-depth and more advanced microbiome analysis. If we move back to amplicon sequencing, then uh, when you have generated your sequencing data, and this will be a lot of FASTQ files that have a lot of sequences in them, but no uh, taxonomy yet. To get to abundance, we use um, one is OTU based, and which is called Operational Taxonomic Unit, um, or there's ASV based, which is which stands for Amplicon Sequencing Variants. Uh, the OTU clustering methods is illustrated here in the left side. And basically you cluster reads sequences that are of high similarity. Then from them, you find one that represents the, each cluster and you assign taxonomy and creates an abundance table based on the number of times you have detected this OTU in your samples. The alternative and more uh, recent uh, established method is the ASV method. Here, instead of clustering based on similarity, you try to estimate what is the error rate in our sample, and you try to resolve uh, ASVs by, with the aim of identifying the true uh, sequence of your uh, sequences. And by doing so, you rely on each sequence, and you don't have this clustering step that lowers your resolution. And now you have the, each uh, read, and you rely on and, and this uh, has the benefit of increasing your resolution. So now you have genus to species resolution of your samples. But you again assign taxonomy and you create an abundance table that you can start analyzing. Shotgun metagenomics, um, the two main approaches is either you rely on reference uh, databases from, for example, NCBI or similar. So the public reference genomes and map your reads to that. Or um, what we are using a lot here at Clinical Microbiomics, uh, the metagenomic species concept, which also allows for de novo discovery so that you can profile bacteria independent of whether or not they're in any reference databases. And that's what you see in the illustration of here. But uh, a stool sample, for example, if you just rely on what's in the reference genome database, usually it's up to 60% you can describe of your sample. But uh, using this, uh, in metagenomic species approach, you can describe the majority of the sample because we are able to do the de novo discovery of the diversity. So the metagenomic species concept, just to give a little bit more insights to what's actually going on uh, when we identify new microbes solely based on uh, sequencing data. And then this is an uh, approach that a concept that was published in 2014 uh, by our CSO, Henrik Björn Nielsen. Um, and to tell it in a very simple way, then the concept is based on that if you have two genes, in this case gene A and gene B, that are found on the same genome from the same bacteria, for example, then uh, when you identify genes across a lot of samples, then you expect these two genes to also be uh, correlating in abundance since they came from the same genome originally. And with this uh, assumption, you can then start clustering genes that always follow each other in abundance across many samples. The more samples you have, the stronger the correlation and the better discovery you will have. Um, and then after you have found all the genes that are uh, co-abundant, uh, you start to do a lot of uh, quality assessment of the genes uh, to make sure that the genes you're putting together are indeed uh, belonging together. And finally, you have what we call metagenomic species, and they represent uh, similar to what a reference genome represents. So these are what we use to describe the sample. And this is an example of uh, how it works, where you have one gene uh, that we are looking at in abundance across 1,200 uh, fecal samples. 
uh, and it's uh, one gene coming from Bacteroides cacae. And uh, in the next plot that you'll see now, we have 4,000 genes, all the other genes that were discovered uh, with co-abundance uh, to belonging to this MGS uh, of Bacteroides cacae. And you see when going back and forward that they are following kind of the same abundance patterns across uh, all the 1200 samples. The benefit, as mentioned, is that you can describe uh, new uh, diversity in the samples. And one example of this is uh, the phylum uh, melana bacteria, which was described first in 2013. And there's currently one uh, single reference species available in MCBI. And uh, by applying this MGS concept, we at Clinical Microgenomics currently have nine different MGS metagenomic species that are belonging to this phylum. So you can see how uh, this uh, way of, of working with the data allows you to describe more of your data and identify diversity that would otherwise not be discovered if you're only relying on, on what's public in the reference uh, genome databases. And these new microbes, even though that they don't have a full taxonomy on them, we can still functionally describe them. So we still know which genes they have and they can be integrated in the analysis just like any other bacteria uh, when you work with them. So now we have generated all the data. Uh, first, we generated uh, fast queue data, a raw sequencing data. And then we either by uh, uh, using shotgun metagenomics approaches, for example, the MGS uh, abundance profiling, or by amplicon sequencing, for example, 16S or 18S ITS, we created abundance tables of the different uh, bacteria in your samples, different microbes in your sample. And these abundance tables are then a, a big list of different uh, organisms and their abundance across multiple samples. And of course, one uh, initial approach, approach one can have is to look into just a single one-dimensional plot looking at one bacteria uh, and its abundance across multiple samples. Now, this, this is a very small fraction of the data set you're anal uh, analyzing now. Uh, you could then go the next step and look at a two-dimensional plot, say, is this one bacteria uh, abundant uh, at the same time as bacteria B? So now, now you see that bacteria A is increased uh, whenever bacteria B is low. So this is two-dimensional plot. But really in your data set, you have around possibly like 2000 species and you would like to really capture the diversity and the differences in your data set. So how do you do that? Because it's, it's, it's not easy to make a, let's say a 2000 dimensional plot. This will never be possible to visualize. And that's where some tools, uh, some bioinformatic tools comes in handy. And we have the principal coordinate analysis which is basically a tool that tries to summarize all the dimensions you have in your data set into a plot that you can visualize. So now we have a two-dimensional plot, but in this case, all of the microbes that were detected in the samples have been taken into account and are affecting uh, how this plot looks. So you could see this as a two-dimensional plot that represents a multi-dimensional data set. And each of the small dots you see here is samples, and these samples are then a group wise connected to the centroids, which are the larger um, dots in the middle. And you can see that the green uh, group up here is definitely different than the group, the blue group down here. Uh, so already now you know that your data set uh, and your microbiome samples, there's a, indeed a difference in your data set. And this can be supported with statistics. In this case, you would often do a PAMANOVA test where you say whether these uh, groupings are significantly different. But now when you know that there is a difference, you of course would like to know what are the differences? What are the specific microbes that are different? And that's where you move on to differential abundance testing. And in this example, we are looking at one single species, Dorea formicicinaris that are significantly lower uh, after this uh, treatment, uh, after the treatment that we're given uh, here. So now you start to understand, okay, these and these species are affected by my treatment, but what if you also have clinical data uh, that you would like to correlate with? 
So that's the next step. And in this step, you take in, for example, as you see here, allergy scores could be one, and you correlate that to the changes you see in your data set. So now you're starting to get a lot more meaningful results out. You know your microbiome has changed, you know your microbiome is affected by the treatment, and you know that this change is also related to the, the phenotype you are interested in. So now you are starting to have like a, a story uh, to tell and uh, you're starting to understand your data. And what we usually do at, at clinical microomics is that at this step is where we then come back to our client and we share with, uh, with you um, all the findings we have had. <clears throat> we share uh, both the methods and we share uh, how the analysis were performed and we share these findings that, okay, this clinical phenotype is highly correlated with these uh, bacteria. Um, and our goal is that this is something that you should be able to publish right after, uh, if that's your, your goal. Um, but it's also uh, at a meeting where we are often finding out that, okay, we, maybe we should go a, a, a level further and go more deep into detail with this data. Um, and uh, so the next few slides is some slides where I would like to show some of the more advanced analysis that one can perform, especially on shotgun metronomics data. And uh, as you see here on this slide, we also have sample reports that we are happy to, to share if you're interested in how, how it looks at this step where you get your results back. So um, this was a covering uh, from sample to basic data analysis. And now I'd like to jump into some of the more advanced analysis. And some of the analysis you will see now is also analysis that we will cover in upcoming webinars where we will go more in detail with it. But a common thing for these uh, analysis is that it depends on, on high quality sequencing data. And I will get into that um, in a little bit. So this first example is uh, the skin microbiome. So we work a lot with uh, skin microbiome and our aim is that we should be able to do shock and metagenomics also on a low biomass samples such as the skin microbiome because the skin mi microbiome is, is really interesting. There's a lot of, uh, the currently are uh, undiscovered and a lot of new findings are being done whenever uh, one really look at it. Um, and one of the main uh, species that people are interested in is Cudibacterium acnes. And you can see Cudibacterium acnes here is the blue species. It's the most abundant species across the different uh, human uh, body sites. Um, and you see, especially here on the right side, you have a, a group of samples that are with high amount of Cudibacterium acnes. So maybe one wants to understand Cudibacterium acnes better. Now we at species level, but um, we can take it to the next level and now find out which subspecies of Cudibacterium acnes do we have. And what you see on the right side is the subspecies or strains uh, that you have of Cudibacterium acnes across 214 individuals. So you're starting to see now that there are actually not just one species, uh, one single type of Cudibacterium acnes. You have more, what in this case looks like five different subclades of, of Cudibacterium acnes. The way we get to this resolution is that we rely on the single nucleotide variants in the data. So as you can imagine now, you should not have a data set that are, have a high error rate. So going back to the Novogen data, the high quality of the data here is really something that we benefit from and it allows us to do these analysis. Because each uh, single nucleotide variant is now being taken into account for, in this case, Bacteroides ovatus. Uh, and based on these uh, single nucleotide uh, variants that I detected, you can create sort of what is the fingerprint of the strains and subspecies you have in your samples. And that's what's summarized in the, in the tree in the middle that are the different bacterial sovatus identified across 242 stool samples. Where this technique gets cool is when you also uh, take into account clinical data. So here we have illustrated now with a circle uh, around the phylogenetic tree, we have illustrated the different um, uh, responses, uh, or the different responses to a treatment where we have recovery and no recovery. So the green, uh, indicates samples from patients where we had recovery, so a good condition. Uh, so therefore, of course, as you see here, whatever th those strains that are in, within this group here are definitely interested, interesting to uh, look further into because they have some sort of relation towards uh, the recovery uh, in this disease. 
So now if you have a strain collection, we, what we can do is that we can take these strains or reference genomes and put them into the data. So now you suddenly have uh, indicate also potential candidates over here. So you have at least uh, five uh, highly interesting candidates that could turn out to be, for example, a probiotic for you or a, a prebiotic target for your, for your specific case. This is also a tool, uh, this fingerprinting using SNV is a tool that we can use for tracking probiotics. So in this case, we had a client that uh, before and after samples uh, where they used a probiotic. But what you can see is that some of the before samples already had a signal if you're looking at the species at, uh, at species level by solution. If we then apply uh, the SNV profiling, we are able to distinguish the species that are already present in the individuals with the probiotic strain because now we know this unique fingerprint of the probiotic strain and we can distinguish the signal. So now you see this uh, result is of course a lot better because now we have positive in all of the individuals uh, where before it was a confused signal due to the endogenous subspecies that were present. With shotgun data, you also get functional uh, data, of course. Uh, and functional uh, data is uh, adding another uh, level to your complexity of your data set. And here we have a tool that we call functional species grouping. This is a very powerful tool because it's a concept where you group bacteria based on their overlapping uh, functionality. And by grouping them based on their overlapping functionality, you have benefits in terms of uh, increased uh, statistical power. So now you're able to better work with the data. You're able to work with this highly multidimensional data in a, in a beneficial way for your statistics. This is a concept that we also used in a publication from 2016, uh, where we connected uh, or we analyzed uh, people with uh, insulin resistance. So humans with insulin resistance uh, and looked at uh, using blood uh, metabolomics data. We looked at which metabolites they had in the, in the blood and correlated this to the phenotype. By doing so, we found out that branched chain amino acids in the blood were correlating with insulin resistance. Now we also had got uh, stool samples from the same individuals. And there we performed shotgun metagenomics analysis. So that means we both get uh, the taxonomical uh, identification of which bacteria are present but we also get which functions are present. And that's where we used the um, uh, functional species grouping concept, uh, where we looked at which uh, uh, gene functions, which pathways were available in the gut, and did any of these correlate with the observed phenotype with the increased branched chain amino acids in the blood also. And there we found branched chain amino acid biosynthesis was indeed increased in the, these individuals. Likewise, was the uptake in the microbes decreased. And the ones, the bacteria responsible for this change was especially Prevotella coli and Bacteroides vulgatus. We followed up with a mouse study where Prevotella coli was uh, gavaged to mice uh, to, to check whether uh, we could confirm this uh, phenotype and it was confirmed also in the mice. This approach where you combine multi-omics data sets is something that we also do uh, in clinical microomics and we are happy to, to discuss with you how we can best integrate these uh, advanced uh, data sets. Uh, it is something we published in 2018 also in Nature Protocols. So if you're interested in looking more into the, what's summarized here in the lower left corner, the, the actual um, uh, approach behind it, uh, you're more than welcome to, to have a look there but we can do this uh, customized to exactly the, your data set. So by mentioning customized, um, this is the, some of the people in our team. Uh, and the way we work is that uh, when you have a new study, we team you up with one of our scientists um, from the company and they will together with you customize exactly what, um, what uh, laboratory work you need and which data analysis you need and you will have direct contact to this person throughout the study so if there is something you want to ask if you want to keep updated with status or you want to discuss the approach you just feel free to reach out uh, our aim is as mentioned uh, to deliver something that are easy to publish so that it's 
sufficiently analyzed uh, for you to fully understand and conclude on, uh, that you can go and publish your data or look uh, into the data in a meaningful way. So we sit down with you, make sure you understand everything, and we make sure that we uh, also are open for planning any new follow-up analysis needed. We often go all the way with our clients to uh, also co-authoring uh, the articles if they are interested in it. Um, so with that, I think I will uh, finish off um, my presentation for today. And we are now moving on to the questions, but I just want to uh, let you know also again that on Thursday, the 24th of September, we will have the next microbiome focus webinar. Uh, the topic will be something that we will have available, available for you uh, soon, but it will likely be where we go more into detail with uh, one of the microbiome uh, topics uh, that, that we have presented today. Yeah. Yes. Thank you so much for this amazing and informative presentation, Jakob. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you on board today. Um, as Jakob mentioned, we will initiate our uh, Q&A session now. And thank you so much for all the questions. Um, the first question uh, is coming from Lisa Parouk. Um, she is um, asking how much stool sample is needed for a human and an animal in general in order to get optimal coverage of taxonomic characterization in the microbiome study. Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, it's, a, it's a good question uh, because there's definitely differences whether you are working with a hu human sample or an animal sample. Um, for human samples, we usually recommend that we have at least uh, 100 milligrams of sample to work with because as you saw in one of the slides, that is uh, uh, equal to around one microgram of DNA. And by analyzing one microgram of DNA, we describe the, the microbiome of the sample in a, pretty well. Of course, we are having a sequenced a full stool sample that will require many, many rounds of uh, DNA extraction and sequencing, but it, this represents very well the, the stool sample. Um, and, and in terms of if you are working with mice, study, mice samples, for example, uh, usually one to two pellets, uh, that is uh, enough for, for generating enough DNA for sequencing also shotgun genomics data. Thanks for the, the answer. And we have another question from uh, Lisa Parouk. Uh, she's asking, will amplicon sequencing uh, based microbiome analysis be able to provide quantitative data? Yeah, so that's a good question because uh, most 16, uh, amplicon data, including 16S and shotgun data is, is relative abundance, meaning that everything sums up to 100%. Um, there are a lot of uh, approaches in the field at the moment to get closer to what you call absolute abundance. Um, and and one of, we, we are also working with different approaches. Uh, one of uh, the, the approach we recommend uh, as the best currently is the way you use a, a spike in. Um, so you use a cell-based spike in in your sample. And uh, comparing this spike in with the signal you get in your, uh, from your sample, you can then uh, calculate the amount of bacteria, you, the bacterial load in the sample you are extracting from. Um, but there are a few other things to take into account there because they, then you of course also need to adjust that you have the same input uh, of samples. So you weigh it usually, um, but likewise, uh, you also have to consider what is the, like, what is the sample material you are, you are analyzing. Uh, but, but yeah, it, it is possible and it's uh, getting increasing increasing attention is a good question. Thanks so much, Jacob. Another question from Alex Sedin. Um, he's asking, what sequencing depth is necessary for detecting fungi at strain level from stool samples? Yeah, also a good question because uh, when you do shotgun metagenomics, um, you sequence uh, whatever DNA is in your sample. So as an example, if you sequence a skin sample, you also sequence the, the human DNA that might be in your sample. And all of, all of these things that you are getting in, they, they uh, lower the signal of what you might be interested in. So let's say you're only interested in fungi, that is your primary target. Um, and fungi are usually uh, very low abundant. In a stool sample, it's definitely less than 1% in a normal individual. So if you're only interested in fungi, you would like to increase the sequencing depth uh, a, a few fold uh, to have a good representation of the, the fungal uh, uh, signal in your sample. 
uh, whether, like to say an exact answer to the depth you need, um, that's a bit risky because it varies between individuals and between uh, extraction methods and between different sample types and so on. So there we would highly recommend that you send some pilot samples first and then based on these pilot samples, we could estimate what is the required depth uh, for, for your study. Because it also depends on which fungi, for example, you're, which species you're interested in. Maybe it's a low abundant species, maybe it's a high abundant species. So it's much better to have a, a pilot test before to be, be sure about this before you move on to the, the sequencing. Thank you so much, Jakob. Um, the last question here um, is from Ervan Sakon. Um, also very interested to know uh, the required depth for optimal uh, SNV approaches afterwards. Yeah, that's a good question. There's a lot of uh, focus at the moment on uh, depth. There's, um, as many of you probably know, there is also uh, people talking about shallow uh, sequencing. Shallow sequence is where you, where you simply just sequence to a, a low depth, usually around one gigabasis or less. Um, by doing so, you can describe the microbiome uh, pretty well. But there is, of course, as you can imagine, when you don't sequence that deep, you will have some limitations to what you can do. And one of the limitations is to apply, for example, this increased resolution from SNV analysis. Uh, because SNV analysis uh, requires that you have a certain coverage of each uh, SNV you're looking at before you can be confident about, confident about the, the signal you're looking at. Um, so we usually recommend, based on whether it's a high or low abundant uh, species you have of interest, uh, to, to an increase uh, to a deeper sequencing than uh, 5 gigabases, which is standard deep sequencing, to maybe, let's say, 10 gigabases. And it doesn't double the price because a lot of the price you're paying is the library preparation. So increasing the sequencing depth is, is not that expensive uh, for your study. But it allows you now to have uh, much more resolution in terms of that you can apply SNV analysis on more of your, your species. Thanks um, a lot. So, so just to, to, to round up, you asked um, five gigabases for example, is also sufficient for the majority of your species. But if it's a low abundant species, then we should go for a deeper sequencing. But for with five gigabases, you can do a lot. Thank you so much. Uh, we can take a couple of more questions. We have a question coming in from Alberto Pascal. He's asking, is it possible to perform SNV analysis on taxonomy target genes such as 16S? Yes. Uh, that's also a, a relevant question. I think it's an, an a, exciting evolution. That, um, there's happening a lot at the moment in the 16S field. Um, so I think if in a year from now, this answer might be uh, very different. Um, but uh, in general, with, with uh, the 16S data, uh, especially when you, when you go start moving on to the ASV analysis, that's where you try to rely on each uh, reach you are generating. And by doing so and getting the confidence in your uh, sequencing reads, you start to also be able to rely on each single nucleotide. Whether or not one dare to do that is a very um, personal uh, decision. Um, and you often can run into this um, decrease in the sequencing uh, when you have uh, MySeq sequencing, for example, 300 base pairs at the end, you have a, a dropped in the sequencing quality. So you need to take a lot of these things into account. But it's getting close to that. We can use um, also these single nucleotide variants in, in the 16S data. It will still not give you the same resolution as for shotgun because there we rely on the full genome and all the SNVs detected. Here you're only relying on the SNVs within this short region. But with the long read 16S that are gaining um, more and more popularity at the moment and uh, allowing us to do more. I think uh, SNV analysis could be something that are also relevant within the next few years for 16S, yes. Cool, thank you so much. We have the last question and then we will uh, end off. Uh, mm -hmm. The question is coming from Christoph Jensen. He's asking, how do you see long read sequencing, sequencing affecting the data analysis moving forward? Yes, so as we just briefly touched upon now with the 16S, uh, indeed long read sequencing has a potential uh, 
within the 16S field for sure, because there we can suddenly rely on a longer region than what we are currently with, which is usually a smaller region than 500 base pairs. Now we can suddenly rely on the full uh, 16S uh, region. So there it's, it's going to help a lot in terms of uh, how the taxonomical resolution we have. Um, and moving forward for shotgun machine data, um, long read is also great for if you want to assemble uh, genomes uh, and if you want to uh, further describe your diversity in your samples, because now we can easier put together genes and, and get in that way a better understanding of the genome. Uh, but the tools, long read versus short read, should also be used uh, differently. Um, I don't think one will replace the other because they have different advantages. One advantage of short reads is that when you want to describe the full diversity in your sample, then it's much uh, better to have many high quality, small high quality reads than having few uh, long reads. Because uh, so for when, when we do profiling of shotgun metagenomics data, we actually like to have many uh, short, high quality reads rather than few long reads. But if you want to build uh, your knowledge and learn more exactly how this microbe is put together, then long reads are going to be uh, a great tool moving ahead. Thank you so much, Jakob. Uh, thank you so much for all the questions. Uh, all, the un uh, all the questions that we haven't answered yet, uh, these will be answered uh, by mail uh, shortly after the webinar. Um, and I will just like to say thank you all for your time um, today. We hope you enjoyed the webinar and found it useful. We'll email you a link uh, to the webinar recording along with a short survey that we would appreciate you taking the time to complete. The survey uh, will, help, uh, will help ensure we make future webinars even more relevant to you and your research goals. In the meantime, please stay in touch. We can, you can follow us both in Overgene and Clinical Microbiomics on Twitter and LinkedIn. Uh, or you can get in touch with, uh, with us um, through our uh, websites. We look forward to seeing you all um, on the next webinars. Thank you so much uh, for attending this webinar.